and let's start. So it first came, so these ten, there's these ten essentials, and this is my picture when I went to um, the Fire Fest when we were doing, not the 9-11 stuff, but at Fire Fest we thought, oh, we should bring some space blankets, give some information. All these flyers are all online from REI, and it's how to pack for a day kayaking trip, how to pack your first aid kit, how to pack for a, um, uh, your first backpacking trip, how to pack for a mountain biking trip, things like that. So I'll show you what I have in some of my packs. That's my mountain biking pack, that's my dog's backpacking pack. Here's my spread out of ice, super essential things, and I'll go over that as we go along. But these are really essential. Having a map, right? And I stuck a map up there, and I'm going to go over how to use a compass, how to use a map. But what if you don't even want to use those things, and you don't have them on a day hike? Looking at your landmarks around you and how to get back. Um, I'm going to have a little blurb on how to use a compass. Very, very simple way to use a compass. So then I decided I'd buy my first compass since I didn't have one. Um, sun protection, important. Along with that, I just like to have bug bug stuff too, because then once you get the bugging and the itching, and then you just have more problems after that. Extra clothing and hat. So I wouldn't wear this hat, but I'm very hot. I like to have this, you know, in the winter when it's just close to your neck, it's nice to keep the wind out. You should always have to have a hat, because how much heat do you lose out of your head? Do you need to get to guess? 80% of the heat you lose from your head. Which is good to have, right, the, um, the brimmed hat when it's sunny to keep that off of you, but that can breathe. But in the winter, as soon as you get cold, it's good to have this. I'm a big layered person. I believe in wool socks, so I wore them for you. Even I'm just like sweating on your wool. <laughs> but I just wanted to wool model. I asked my daughter, she goes, you bet she didn't look dorky in front of people like that, but this is, um, these are from Costco, they're like $21, and it's wool. So it's like smart wool in it, and it's one of those things you can wear when it's cool, um, it keeps you warm, and then it breathes the sweat, it gets a little stinky here and there, but it's nice to have this layer, and a fleece layer, and then one of these kind of layers like that, and then when you're sweating up the hill, you can take off some layers and then get, you know, stay warm with a hat on. So those are important things. And we'll get into like before it gets dark and you're thinking about making a shelter, doing that before it gets too dark and you can't see. So extra clothing and hats. Not cotton and jeans and things like that. Headlamp and flashlight. I really am a firm believer in headlamps I like having my hands free because being the nurse, someone's usually getting hurt and then getting my hands free. Um, first aid and supplies. Then what goes along with the flashlight? Like every year you don't use it, so I have to check that. So they say, you know when you change your batteries and your your um, your smoke protector, and then I kind of check the batteries in my disaster pack and, you know, probably take the cash out of there that I may need. <laughs> I probably need it for a disaster. Um, and then first aid supplies. So I have like little of these first aid supplies in various places. So here's my little mini one. And so then I just pack in as much as I can of important things. So something like an antimicrobial wipe, a little thing of soap, some band-aids, the little tiny super glues you can buy that come in like little three and four packs, and then like any good ER nurse, Benadryl in case someone's having an allergic reaction. When you're over 40 and you're working too hard, you need 800 Motrin. <laughs> someone's having chest pain, you should have an aspirin in here. And so um, a Claritin, if things are bothering you, so and I try to have some Advil, so important things like that. Um, but Benadryl is an important one to have in there. Aspirin, Motrin, um, things like that. In this bigger one, so that's kind of like my mountain bike one, I kind of put this in here, but I do have a space blanket because I've been out where someone's broken their leg and I've had to use a fender to keep the leg and then someone had to come in and it took them like 10 hours to find them, so then it got wrapped up in this. I just started now carrying it in my backpack for that. And like a zip tie, extra food, and a little flashlight. Even though it's just a mountain bike, right? Because you never know, right? Because it's, it's these big backpacking trips people are planning for, staying out overnight. The daytime things, you're like, ooh, I'm just going for a couple hours. 
So in my bigger one, I think of getting dehydrated, so or upset stomachs. You don't want to be having vomiting and diarrhea. So I have some some Pepto Bismol tablets. In these little Tylenol things, I'm like one of those bad ER nurses that mixes Tylenol and Motrin and a bunch of different things in one little container, but I know them all. <laughs> and hopefully I won't forget them. And then I just pack in big band-aids, little band-aids. There's the Benadryl all the time, the Advil, the aspirin, little white bees, Betadine. So I kind of have the bigger and the little things. And you can buy all these, you know. I even make my kids put them in their own camel packs. So there's first aid supplies. Fire starter and matches. I'm supposed to tell everybody not to start a fire today if you're in the wilderness. So this is free. What is this? This is lint. This just comes out of the dryer. This could start a fire easily out in the woods. But being my husband, being a wildland firefighter, he's like, could you just say in an extreme emergency, start the fire? Right? In a little kind of area that maybe it might not go too far. Then I have my matches in there. And then, of course, my favorite thing, duct tape, can do anything. Duct tape for blisters, duct tape to keep the bottom of your shoe that just came off, duct tape for my kid's foot cut, whatever. So some of these have like a little mirror that you can shine to get attention from planes. But I just get lint and I stick them in here. This is a nice little waterproof, tiny little thing. Super simple. Yeah. My kids think this is cooler because it has a whistle on it if someone can hear you. Yes? Yeah, what is this? That's like a biohazard, like one of those one oh, big okay. suits or something okay. like that. If you were going in, maybe you're going in in someone's house. Okay. Like that. So this one has a good whistle on it, which is important. But this is very important. This is a large thing of super glue, but you can super glue blisters, cuts and everything, and we'll talk about really how clean does a wound have to be. We'll talk about that too. So fire starter matches the emergency shelter, and I'm talk about that, and I have that written up here. Your knife, your tools, your repair kit. So my favorite comfortable knife is this, and I have one in my car, I have it in my purse. My kids all know this, that I have this around. And then, of course, I have my bike tool that works like this. But this doesn't have the same things as this, but it's kind of heavy, so sometimes I just wing it and just bring duct tape. But this has lots of other things for backpacking. And this will go good for the wine. I was going to say, <laughs> wine before it's true. Yes. When you're out there for a long time, I also have a cribbage boarding cart. <laughs> I can be out there for a long time and I have some fun. And then you, uh, nutrition and hydration, we have a specific uh, uh, slide on that because really if you have only nutrition and you have no water you should not be eating. You know that whole thing if you're on a desert island and there's food and you eat food and stuff like that. You do not want to eat the food if you have no water. You will die like twice as fast because it takes so much water to digest food. You just be dehydrated. Okay. There's a lot of information. So there's all my stuff that I just should off the duct tape and everything. So this is, this is the cool thing about um, improvisation, is that, so I have a medical background, everybody can take a first aid class, read something first aid, but the coolest thing is it's really just creativity and imagination, right? Because you can see all these things, I brought all these things, you can use these for splints, and there's duct tape on this, and you can use this to put someone's legs through and put it around their hips if they have a pelvic pain or anything like that. And, could split this to a leg and you could put these through these arms and zip it up and make a little litter. And where's my really cool, like, I bring this out for my thermarest so I can have like a little chair when I'm backpacking, but how awesome would that be to carry somebody out in? So, and that's if like the CHP helicopter can't come get you or you need to rendezvous with an ambulance or something. So at the heart of field medicine is improvisation, so it's creative, it's formal science, but common sense problem solving. Defined as to fabricate out of what is conveniently at hand. So it's nice if you have planned those pen essentials um, on those shorter trips. And then improvisation encompasses many variations, is governed by few absolute rights or wrongs, and is limited more often by your imagination than 
personnel or equipment. A lot of things can be used to carry someone right here on the backpack. Does anybody have any questions about that? Now when you're going out with your five other zones, are you going to take all this or you still get it? No, interestingly enough, um, being the ER nurse, who's expected to bring in a first aid kit? <laughs> Husband, firefighter, and the kids don't even take it. I'm like, you need to take it with your friends. You need to take the band-aids and those kinds of things. And so, um, kind of had to communicate with your group. Jo if you don't know Joanne Jones, she's one of our nurses who's been in the ER for like 30 years. She went out with a group of women, group experienced hikers. They went out to Silver Lake looking at flowers, what do women do? They're just looking at the flowers, they're talking, they're walking, and all of a sudden someone looks like, and they're just like, we have no idea where we are. <laughs> we, and, they, and, then like, and then four of them pointed this way, four of them pointed that way, and they really did not even know where they went. They, and, and that, in fact, Joanne didn't even have a first aid kit, but she had a compass in her pocket. Oh, she's so awesome, and she's like, I just happened to bring it because, but I just happened to bring it, but I thought I was going with a bunch of experienced people. You know what I mean? So that's really good is because what's, what you're looking forward it looks completely different when you're looking backwards, and so it's really good to look at high points and mountains. We all know where Pyramid Peak is, where Talak is. We kind of know where Frio is, but that's just because of comfort, but how many people here just come here and they don't really know where they're going? So it really is to be like, I'm going to be the designated person and I'm going to bring the medication and the first aid kind of stuff. Can you bring the food? What if we run out? How much water do we have? Um, if we get to a stream, how can we you know, clean some water? So I'll show you some simple things that are come out too. What's that like? Oh yeah, so this is all about testing your creations on a non-injured person. Like work out the bugs first, right? So there's some goofy pictures of I just practice and all these things. Oh, you can go back. Um, goofy pictures of my son. He wanted me to take him out. Was splinting his leg with hats and like, like right if they had an open fracture and it was bleeding or something, and you needed to soak up some blood and they had an open fracture, you could put this all around their leg and then you could put a stick near it. Then you could wrap some tape around. Them. So you covered it, you soak up some blood, and then you could carry him out and that thing. Okay. So include materials that lend themselves to improvisation. So we love the duct tape and paddles and sticks and whistles and things like that. So creativity is needed. The fixed in gear we decided that can be used, right? And some people are gonna have, I mean, you're gonna have some pain. No one's died from like walking on a twisted ankle or even probably no one's died from walking on a rope. One would be very fun though, right? But you could improvise some sticks and stuff like that and you already have some duct tape on here and you could walk with these if you need to, right? And change them. Or you could use sticks if you were out there. So practice constructing, this is fun stuff. My kids get into this making things out of sticks and we'll show a bunch of pictures so there's more visuals. Go ahead. So it's possible to take a companion Right, because you do, if you're doing stuff alone, when when is it usually that you, your phone doesn't work, right? So it's always better to take, when people said, don't go hiking by yourself, don't go surfing by yourself, don't go kayaking by yourself. If you're in a group, know each member's strengths and weaknesses. This is what I learned when I do this. Plan your activity within the comfortable reach of the weakest member of your party. So you are going up to lack, going up to lack, and then people start spreading out, right? The stronger people are way up here, and you got people in the middle, and then you have this one person that's way in the back. So having knowing that ahead of time that hey, I'm just gonna stay at this lower level of cathedral, and I'm not gonna go all the way to the top. So having the communication with people, and people just get in their head that if I don't get to the top, then I'm not okay, or that was my goal, so I have to do it. People just have to let that go. So, no, so matching it to the weakest member of your party. Tell someone at home where you're going, your estimated time of return, and know when you're going to contact search and rescue. My husband's a wildland firefighter. He does not do that. He just thinks, see, but they just go off and do their own adventure thing, right? They just go and do that. So, so sometimes I have to ask, but it's just not about him. So he's got to come and tell us. Okay. Okay, so my daughter had this head laceration, and you know, who wants to spend money getting the head stone up, right? So, my daughter has, and there might be a picture, but anyway, there is later on. So it was kind of about kind of this oval like this. So I cleaned it out really well because people we kind of down south, kind of in the middle of nowhere, 
and there could have been a hospital I could have gone to, but I kind of knew how to do this because of this book. I cleaned it out really well, washed it, washed it. We'll talk about how it's not so much the dirtiness of it, it's just how clean you get it out. So I cleaned it out, put a bunch of basic tracing on it, then I put a piece of floss through the middle of it, which sounds kind of strange, right? What's the floss going to do? And you don't have to do the floss, but I do keep floss with me too. And then I tied my daughter's hair across it, tied it in the knot, tied it in the knot, crossed it over, tied it in a knot, which is what you're doing when you're doing sutures, right? But what do we usually do in heads? In the emergency room, we usually just staple, 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 because you can't really see. It's not gonna be an ugly scar, because you're not gonna see it. So I tied knots, and then the little piece of, so I tied the knots across like that. Then I took this piece of floss, and then just tied it around a couple times around the knots, and it just stayed. You know, you just put a bunch of neosporine on it, and four days later, boom, here. So, like with my son's short hair, I wouldn't be able to do it. You probably could just glue it, use some super glue here on the country. But you really have to go back and go to the emergency room for those kinds of things. But we'll talk about cleaning it out well. Um, a really good Downeyville expert rider had no protective gear on except a helmet going very fast, hit the front of his leg and broke a tibial plateau fracture. It was about 14 miles in. Luckily, there was an anesthesiologist behind us who had good drugs. <laughs> the two nurses, the two ER nurses, someone broke a fender off their bike. You know, some of them have those big fenders on their bike, the motor motor cross kind of not bikes. And that fender with a bunch of a sweatshirt just completely, we just splinted it with the fender and a bunch of duct tape gave him some pills, got a bag of ice from, you know, just got some cold water down in there, and then said, it looks like you're good until someone gets you, right? So either a helicopter or basically an ambulance. So we kind of improv that, but immobilizing it, right? Controlling the, re the bleeding and keeping it from moving and getting him in a comfortable position. If they're kind of shocky, right? Then putting his legs up and putting his head down a little bit longer, and he's gonna be there for a long time. Someone needs to keep giving him water and someone needs to be there because I just be calm. It's the main thing. We had a friend that broke off their mountain bike seat way up on um, Armstrong Pass. So how do you really ride your mountain bike when you don't have a seat? Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Plus you got a lot of padding. Oh, so duct tape was what it did. So we put it on really short, like moved it down next to each other, and so the post was kind of like, you know, the posts were kind of like next to each other like this, and then we just duct taped the heck out of it, and then you just had to ride like really low, <laughs> down the hill like that, and it worked, and you got down the hill, so I swear if I did, I got duct tape on everything. I love it. In fact, I'm not even wearing it right now, but I should be. Um, so I went backpacking with the kids, and I had no, this really cool rope I did not have, I thought I had, I didn't have. And so I took every single, I had to hang the food bear, um, you know, I had to hang the food when I'm backpacking. So I took every single one of these straps that I had in all the backpacks and put them all together, put all the food in the dog pack, and then put this, let's see, how did I do that? So then I thought, okay, how am I, this is just being creative. So I just stuck this over here, I put a bunch of rocks in here, and then I just kept on throwing it over and over this big, huge stick that was coming off a tree. But of course, what gets caught on um, every single thing? So every single one of these things got caught sure. sliding over it. So anyway, so it's nice to bring a nice, this is called parachute, parachute things. And I would put this in the first day kit because you can do so many things with this little tiny thing. And one of the paramedics, I guess they carry this around everywhere they go. So that's like another really neat thing. And then we just hiked up the food in the dog backpack, the toothpaste and everything, and then just hiked it up into the air, and the bear never bothered us, which was great. So the common, the common theme throughout all is just, uh, it's just, it's just common sense through the experience, and it's, anyway, that's good. So I was thinking, I showed this as a bad picture that I was skiing by myself, but I'm like, well, who the heck took a picture of me? So my friend took a picture of me, I wasn't by myself. But I had a hat on, I had water with me, I had first aid kit, I could use this. This has a sharp knifey thing on the bottom, so that was, that was cross-country skiing. And what the heck, you could use this for something right here. 
kind of have to ruin that thing that if you broke something, you can use a sign. You can just not go over and use it. <laughs> so this gets good. So if you're getting bored, we'll get some really cool pictures of like things in tongues and stuff like that. would be really great. So this was one for some of the medics to keep an airway open. But the best thing you can do, I mean, you don't even need to read any of this, but what is a rescue position? The best rescue position is to have your person lay on their side. So if they're on their back and they're and the thing that they choke on usually and having difficult with their airway is their tongue. So a rescue position is kind of like how you lay in your bed on your side. You lay on your side like this. And then if you put their head forward, their tongue kind of goes out. And then if they vomit, they can go forward like that. They don't choke on their tongues. The rescue position is the best one if you have to actually leave them and go get help. There's a rescue position, putting the blanket around, you know, you know having water near them and food and things like that, if there's only two of you. Otherwise, you would want to leave a victim alone. Don't even go on that. That's all for you. This is if you were getting bored. <laughs> this is if you were bored, Harold, in the back and you wanted to see something super cool. The paramedics like this kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, who gets nosebleeds up here all the time? They get dehydrated, it's dry, you're behind in fluids and stuff like that. So, But most, I would say 80 to 90% of nosebleeds, you can come in, <laughs> um, are anterior. So they're in the front. So what works really good is just a bunch of toilet paper, um, I hate to say it, but you know, uh, half of a tampon works great. You put the strings out and you can pull it out later if you need it to, but you can put that up in there. Um, uh, it just reduces the humidity and stuff like that. So most of them are anterior. It, it is getting to be more of a call the helicopter type thing if you're bleeding a lot and it's a posterior bleed, and that's when you can't stop it. So it's putting pressure on this for a good 10 minutes. You know, you don't carry nose clamps around. Duct tape's not going to help this. You basically need to have them be laying down. An ice pack can help behind here or on their nose, but holding pressure for a good 10 minutes. And at the same time, you can put the tissue in there. What you can do for if someone falls and gets a stick in their lung or something like that, you don't want to pull it out because you'll hear a bunch of air and then that'll really freak you out. So, Leave it in, but you can use some of these gauzes and cover it on three sides and just put some duct tape, or you don't have to have any, any gauze at all. And you can cover it on three sides, and so oh, it won't suck a lot of air in, but it can just protect it from a lot of infections. So like, that's obviously a 911. Like, you need to get the CG helicopter if someone's falling in your room. Cervical spine injuries. There's a lot of stuff on this. So, very busy slide. If someone falls and they are complaining of neck pain, it is the best thing not to move them. I carry a SAM splint around, and you can get those all around. They're just like this little kind of splint that comes around here. But you can use anything that's firm. You could roll, you could use this, you could use this and tighten it up super really well. If someone fell and they had cervical spine tenderness, that means when you went down the back of their neck like that, it hurts. You should not move them. That is an emergency. You could do this, right, like that, as tough as they could, and they can't be, this can't be immobile, and then you can't be moving all the rest of your body, right? <laughs> you kind of have to have your whole torso not moving. So that's a medical emergency see if they fall and they're having point tenderness. Everything they do, someone needs to be holding their head and they need to roll in one log, roll this way or this way, and that's getting like a medical helicopter. Or some sort of litter that you're gonna carry them out. So quick question. Yes. So if they're at an odd angle, do you turn them to the center position or leave them at an odd angle? You wanna leave, you wanna log, roll them all in one piece. So if they're at an angle like that, you want to hold them in that position like that, and then get them back like this, and then leave it in that position. So maybe not straight like this. So I am a thermorest person, but in older, before thermorest, they used to just have those plain foam pads, and they say that if you have those foam pads, you should always have like a little piece, because it, it will protect you from being cold. 
Um, and these heat lists, that, this is using a backpack, cervical stabilizer. You could put jeans on both sides of those. You could put all, all sorts of stuff like that you could put on here. This is the, um, the actual collar that they'll use for elbows and things like that. Here they use some tape and some sort of backpack there. But these are what the medics probably take in the back country. I have one of those too because I dig these out of the, when they're used, I clean them all off and then I keep them. <laughs> when they come in the worship serum. Because then they ask me to go on field trips. So then I have them. So the main thing is just immobilizing them and not move, letting them move. Okay? But what are you talking to? I mean, you're, t you're, you're making sure you're, when, once you restrain someone, you want to make sure they're breathing and they're calm, stuff like that. So here's some other ways. And who's walking on these anymore? Are you kidding me? <laughs> those, are like, those are like hanging on my wall by my fireplace. No one, no one walks on them. But you could, like, if you had little tiny ones, you could put that on a calf or an ankle or anything like that. This is just showing all these. This is perfect. No, this is good. Um, so here's the splint again, but you could use pieces of all of this. You could break this up and that, that too, if you needed to. That's why I always like to have duct tape. Here's that foam pad, or you could blow this up, right? If you had a lot of bleeding, you could actually, like, even if you had to put this around someone's leg, you could put a bunch of gauze, you could cut off the end of this holder, right? This is a thermarest, and then you could use this as a sleeve, put a bunch of clothes in it, and put it around a neck if you needed to. This is if someone has a broken leg, and you need to pull some traction on it. And this is just a little blurb. If someone breaks, you can bleed to death from two things, a fractured femur or a fractured pelvis. So the things you want to do is you want to have the space smaller, right? What if, if the space is really big, then more bleeding can get into it too. I really didn't want to do this in my skirt, but <laughs> I want to show you. So anyway, somehow you could do it like this and you could lay there. But if you needed to put this on, you could make this very big and turn it around. And the smaller the space in the hip, it keeps the vessels together so you wouldn't bleed to death. Now, in a femur fracture, when it is a round space, when it is broken, like, oops, do I like this? So if this is the femur like this, and then it breaks. This rounder area can bleed, so as soon as you pull and straighten it back out like you can with here, slicing this here, and maybe putting this here and pulling some tension on it with some tape, it can make less space, and actually you can get an amazing amount of comfort for the patient. They'll be like, oh, that may be still hurt. <laughs> You'd like to have an anesthesiologist that's right. <laughs> extra medicine. I mean, not the propofol or anything crazy like the Michael Jackson thing, but um, something that's a little lighter. Yes, there's my son, and he's got a stick, and there's the hat, because it's like an open wound. There's a bigger one, so he's showing me the hat. He's using, um, he's got duct tape around his, he's got, he has duct tape on his pole all the way up. But he's showing layers. This is a cotton layer. That wouldn't be very great, but the hat would be. Right? You just threw a hat in there for the day. So using what you have. Go ahead. So this would be a nice, this is a great splint. So I just had this happen, not to me, but um, on my Memorial Day field trip, uh, um, camp trip, someone dislocated their shoulder and broke their humerus. So I tried to put it back in, that didn't work, so it's just a lot of traction and holding, I didn't have that splint. But you can do this a lot with lots of um, wood, jeans. Um, uh, this right here would be pretty, pretty comfortable because it's nice and you know foamy. You can wrap this around it like that. You could use a part of a ski, a pole would be good. Or this is just nice and firm like that, or the, or the paddle. So it just shows you how to immobilize things because immobilizing it is comfortable. This is great. Safety pins are right in there. So on in your back, in your um, in your little doodad, safety pins are the bomb. So that I have like 20 uses for safety pins. So always add safety pins in there. 
because those aren't just every, they're not, you don't think of them. So this just makes a really nice little sling, right? You break your, you dislocate your shoulder, you fracture your clavicle, you fracture your elbow, you fracture your forearm, you break your wrist, maybe it just goes on and on, right? Where would you be at the hospital if you live in this case? Right? <laughs> So, but here's a couple of things you can do with um, using safety pins and bummer if you had bilateral ones. Someone would have to have to help you go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the hard part. That would be the hard part, washing your hair. So, <laughs> so I, and really, I have no idea what that is in the far corner. <laughs> if I didn't hear you something, that guy has a dislocated shoulder. That's the guy that looked like that's a dislocated. This is a dislocated shoulder. So anyway, you can just, I'll just show you a couple of things. You guys aren't going to be doing these, but we tried all these, and I couldn't get a shoulder back in. That was the worst fracture they've ever seen at Marshall. We were up camping. But we tried all these things because I had paramedics with me and stuff like that, and it just didn't work. There's different ways you can do it. Okay. So in wound management, this is great because we always fall, right? We get cuts, and we get blisters, and we fall on our knees, etc. So the same principles that govern wound management in the emergency department apply in the field. So the main problem is access to the adequate supplies, right? So um, in deciding to close a wound primarily or pack it open, take into account the mechanism of the injury, right? Is it a puncture? Is it a slice? Is it a gaping wound? The age of the wound? The side of it? Is it a bending part where you're moving all the time? The degree of contamination, the ability to effectively bleed, and we'll go on to the next where it talks about bleeding. So here's where this gets really great. The primary determinants of an infection in bacterial counts um, and amount of de devitalized tissue re remaining in the wounds. The bottom line is it's the amount of irrigation, it's just cleaning it and cleaning it and cleaning it. And it can be with stream water, just, clean, just getting the debris out and getting it back, getting it out. Okay, so you really and it has to do with the pressure. It's not just kind of just doing this and pouring it. It's like puncturing a hole in this and just going squirting it. Okay, you know, or filling up um, filling up a Ziploc bag, right? Filling this up with some stream water and putting a little tiny hole and then just like you know like King Moss. Spray like that. Okay. So the solution to pollution is dilution. So diluting it and cleaning it out is the best you can. Go ahead. So what's best? Well, what do you have, right? What is? What do you have that's with you? Normal saline. Who's carrying that around? Nobody. <laughs> In a study of ago, oh, doctors and doctors and nurses are really into these numbers. So tap water was recently found to be as effective for irrigating wounds as sterile saline. So, did I need to bring my daughter to the ER to have them use normal saline? Sorry, not to bad on the bill. For $1,000, I just squirted the heck out of it and tied it myself. But, you know, some of them do really do need lots of stitches, big, gapy ones. So, um, the sandwich bag, the garbage bag. Ooh, and the safety pin. See, always use a safety pin. Because you could safety pin it together, right? You could be their best friend later, or you could do me that way. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, disinfect the water with iodine tablets if you have those. Normal saline, seal the bag, puncture the bottom of the bag. And we already went through that. We don't need to do that. <coughs> wound closure. Before, before a wound is closed, remove all the foreign material and grossly devitalized tissue. Okay, that's pretty. Right, you're not going to leave a bunch of dirt in there and stuff like that. You can accomplish debridement using scissors at night for any other sharp object. That is why that pocket knife. Closed wounds with sutures, staples, pin, tape, pins, or glues. Okay, so I had the opportunity of having a dog that was a rescue dog at Kirkwood. And what do dogs do when they're running next to skis? They get their feet cut. They probably have had this for a million, million years. But it has a lot of staples in it, so I just cleaned it out. And then when my dog, whenever my dog got needed, you know, staples, I stapled it and dug it. So. That's what I use that one for. It's probably pretty old. Take them to the vet and get, I don't know, some antibiotics for it or something like that. Staples work good for those kind of cuts if you have those. But glue is my favorite. And duct tape. Let's see. 
most important, the co okay, so here it is. This is hard for me as a Leo. Most important, the cosmetic outcomes, not compromise. So I really like it to look nice. But when it's in the hair, we don't have to look at that. Go ahead and go. Skin tapes are useful for shallow, non-gaping wounds, um, including reduced need for anesthesia, ease of application. A lot of people have like tequila and that kind of stuff out on their backpacking trip, so if they want, they can make sure that and then do that if they want to. A strong, any strong tape can be improvised to skin tape, you know, using duct tape. It works the best. They usually say in the emergency room if you're coming in, they need to do stitches and gaping one within about eight hours. So people that are coming in 12, 18, 16 hours, meaning if it's really, really dirty, then they're gonna have to open it up, clean it out, and re-suture that. But you can buy yourself time back there. All right, moving on. So obviously, stop the bleeding and dry the wound edges. Wound taping does not work well over joints, right, because they move and they're hairy. You can use glue, um, secure some of the tape to the side of the wound, and pose the opposite wound edge with a finger. But you're just going to improvise when you're back to make sure you have some tape. But oh, here's some of the gaping ones. They have a little bit of serous drainage, which is kind of like that clearish reddish drainage, and that will be there. So you, sometimes you need a little bit of space for that. You don't want it to be completely anaerobic, if you will, and closed off to no air. And then you can use glue if you want it. It can come off later, but this is if you're out in that country. Improvisation. Okay. There's some super glues. So yeah, there's these little tubes that come in like four and five pack. Those are scary strips. I don't know if you can buy those in the. If you can buy those in the grocery store, but you can have little tiny band aids. All right. That's good. Here, here's the derma bond. There's like a stapler kind kind of thing. But this would be the same thing as, um, you know, super glue in the back country. Obviously, this right here could easily hit the optic nerve, so it's like a little bit more important. But um, anyway, that's just a type of thing. Are we trying to get the super glue into the wound itself, or on the No, we just want to be able to clean it and clean the wound and then bring it together. It's nice if you could have two hands. Right? And if you get the other person who has it or has it to hold it like that and then just glue the edges together after it's clean. Right. Yeah. And then if you wanted, you could do a super thin, thin piece. Like if you were just worried because it was on a really bending part, you could use like a super small piece that was cut right there just to go over to help it just stay together. That's why it's really fun. So that's what I did and it worked. Anything on the face from the neck up takes about four to five days to heal. As, so it bleeds a lot. That's why it's creepy and scary when people get bloody noses, cut their ears, cut their face. It bleeds a lot, but because it, it has such good blood flow, it heals very fast. So the stitches you'd get in an arm or a leg would stay in seven to ten days. Anything on the face and hair is like five, four to five days. So that worked. This is if someone broke their finger or had an injury and you had to get a ring off. So we have ring cutters and stuff like that. But the cool thing about this, you can actually watch this on YouTube. You can use floss, my favorite, again. I wish my kids used it more to floss their teeth. <laughs> so the cool thing is that you can put it under the ring. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see how it's put yes. under the ring this way? How it's put under the ring, yeah. and then you wrap, 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 and just squish that tissue, and then get it flat so it goes out, so the swelling and the knuckles, so all of it goes out to here. Then when you start pulling this and unraveling it like that, and unraveling it, it pulls it out towards, and you can get it over the part of the knuckle. This works better if you're like, maybe you could put the hand in the stream, right, to get swelling down. So what are you doing when you're hiking? Your hands are all down here, and they get all puffy, it's being puffy. So that's if you really need to get a ring off, because people could really lose, or maybe go hiking with no rings. Might be a good idea. <laughs> so exposure of unprotective eyes, we see this all the time at high altitudes. And I don't know. 
if you lose a lens, if you lose a lens in your, does everybody hike with glasses on? Yes. Everybody does. Or at least with you. What's that? Is it at least with you? They're always, yeah. So what happens if you, if you're with glasses on and you lose a lens, you can actually just take a piece of duct tape, again, <laughs> uh, take a duct tape and, and put like a little slit in it so you can see, but it will protect your eye. Not a bunch of dots, but just a little tiny slit. So even if you were really high altitude, like if you were up at Kirkwood or whatever, you lost the lens, and, or you're gonna be out there for a long time and you weren't gonna, but no one else had extra sunglasses and you weren't gonna stop your backpacking trip of a week or something but you need to cover it and not go out with it. And you were on a lot of um, reflective sun, a reflective a snow or granite. You would need to put a piece of duct tape over on your little so that's you look at that. You want that. So there's these carriers. I think we'll just go and see. So, is it, okay, go, yeah, maybe you can just come help me. There's the two, yeah, so here's the two carry system right here. So if you had this, you could do it with sticks and things like that, right? You can come over here like that. If you both had backpacks on, we could put this behind us right here, and the person could sit on that, and they could have their arms around us, and we could have their arms around them. Or we could be just only holding this, and they would put their bottom on this, and then they could put their hands around us, and we could actually walk and carry. Fun, huh? On a really long, skinny yeah. trail. Yeah. Sideways like this. <laughs> Very fun. But that's one way of doing it is getting them in a backpack. So there's a couple different um, ways you can carry people. I like there's some other ones in here that I like better. This uh, so we'll just do this the split coil seat transport and you can do this one. So these are a lot of rock climbing ways you can do it if you have a lot of extra rope. I don't think I don't think I could do it with this little tiny rope like this. But I love this idea of looping it like this. Then the person puts it between between their legs. <clears throat> and then the person who's carrying them puts them on their shoulders. Here's a different way of doing it. I guess you could do this with <clears throat> you could tie some pants together. You could tie a tent together. <coughs> you could use a bunch of these straps together. And maybe do this. If they truly broke your ankle and you weren't going very far. This is really good to have any kind of extra straps and things like that. Like the minimum backpack you should be carrying is that camel pack. And that's because you're on a mountain bike, right? But normally you should be carrying any kind of just a regular day pack stuff. <coughs> and you may not use all of it. But when you need it, ooh, you're going to wish you had it. Go ahead and go, yeah. Okay, here's like another <clears throat> thing where you could use with paddles, with large sticks, with these types of things. You could put these through jacket sleeves. We could actually carry people out. These are just other ways of using duct tape, frames of backpacks, like that. Sleeping bags, skis and poles, ropes, you can see how you can keep someone warm. These are the types of things, you, of course, you want to practice, but you probably will figure it out when you're out there. So your toolkit, a knife, tape, you can go through that. Basic cable ties. Oh my gosh, I love this. And so today I had a birthday party with 20 kids because that was a real hoot. And um, they wanted to play volleyball. We only have a small front lawn. And so the badminton net, the badminton net worked better. And so I just used zip ties. And zip tied to this and zip tied to that. So zip ties were awesome to have to like fix things on bikes and buckles, boots. Skis, snowshoes, maybe this is another thing. So I like having those zip ties. You can buy those big ones, you know, with all the different sizes. Here's the parachute cord. And I swapped some when I think I swapped like food and a headlamp or something like that. That's good. <laughs> um, and then safety pins, and we'll go through the uses of all those. I don't usually use wire, but like some of the paramedics are saying they use a supple type wire bolts and wing nuts. I wouldn't bring that. I bet you a mechanic would bring that. 
Yeah. Right. So I'll be the nurse. I'll bring the first aid kit and bring the wire and the bolts and the um, the wire nip cutter, or the whatever, the screwdriver. So I, would, I probably wouldn't use this, but uh, prefabricated crossbar. But I would use these things as a crossbar, duct tape across them, or in pants or something like that. Uh, this is that that cellulite foam pad that they used to, like the old sleeping bag, and it's a really good one for the keep you the warmest and protecting you. Um, but it's still the ultimate padding for using a splint or a rescue device. But of course, the die-hard thermorests that we love to blow them up and then let the air go out of them, try to blow them up again and let the air go out of them, that they have their place too. But I like it because I like to sit on the rocks, and so I think using that and this, and I already have some bars in it, that you literally could, you know, you could actually put somebody in here. I don't know, a small child, and you could carry them out. Fluorescent survivors tape. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit having the bright yellow tape, which would be great if you were on some dark rock, but then there's fluorescent, there's glow in the dark duct tape. There is. But like, would you want white duct tape if you were out in the snow? Probably not. So that you may have different color duct tapes for different types of hikes. <laughs> My kids are into that tie dyes, stuff like that. So it can be used like Hansel and Gretel and breadcrumbs to help relocate you. A space blanket can help you when you have that. That actually keeps you warm. It can do some tarps and shelters and I'll turn this around. I have a poncho that I have like this, which is separate from, like I would want, I would use this as a, as a tarp for rain. I would use this as a safety, like warm type thing. But I would use this poncho or something like that. I'll show you on the other side of this on how you could use it with this rope to make a shelter if you had to like shelter down overnight. <clears throat> so advantage of the space blanket that the hospital gave is just so cool is um, over types the small size and there's a good chance it'll be packed for any trip. So like I have them everywhere now. So using two safety pins to pin the anterior aspect of a tongue, we saw that, that was really cool. Replacing a lost screw and a pair of eyeglasses to prevent the lens from falling out and improvising glasses, so drawing two circles. You could, yeah, if you lost both of your lenses, or let's say you had no glasses at all and they fell off a cliff or something like that, you literally could, and I'm not going to do this right now, I just had my hair done. You could, like, go across like this and you could make a little slip like that, and you could have some awesome sunglasses. <laughs> you may trip and fall and hurt your knee, but hopefully someone will have a first aid kit. <laughs> and then go on with safety pins. Neurosensory for skin testing, so like if someone, you know, you could test to see if someone was having any nerve damage in when they fell. Um, doing the puncture of the bags for irrigating wounds, removing embedded foreign bodies, so like a splinter, draining an abscess or blister. Um, Relieving um, a hematoma, you don't use a fish hook, use a finger splint, use a sewing needle or dental floss as thread, holding gaping wounds together. Because really, if it was like a huge gaping wound, you literally can hold it together, right? With that, and maybe a loose piece of duct tape around there. Replacing a broken zipper, holding gloves or mittens to a coat sleeve. Okay. Let's <laughs> see if this is any kind of fire deal. Wasn't that nice? It's the hospital. Don't think it's here. Hey, can I call you back? I'm doing the class. Is it yeah. No. Did the hospital be here? <laughs> um, unclogging camping stove jets. Oh, so holding gloves on your mittens. And so that's kind of cool. If you were transporting someone, and they had a broken arm and they couldn't use their fingers or something like that, you could put the glove on their hand and then like safety pin or lightly tape the glove on there if it was cold. Uh, pinning triage notes to multiple victims, such as a bad day. You could put a bunch of notes on people <laughs> to, to, uh, to sort them out on who's sick and who's not. Um, removing corneal foreign body like on your eyelid or something like that in a sling or a swath for the shoulder, fixing a ski binding, extracting a clot from a thrombosed hemorrhoid. Oh, 
You might, you either want to have a total stranger doing that or maybe someone really close to them. <laughs> a pin is strapped to a shirt tightly around the chest for a rib fracture. Yeah, so, you know, nowadays in the ER, we give people pain medicine and for rib fractures because we want them to take deep breaths and cough. We don't want them to get pneumonia. We don't want them to splint. If you were in the back country, you didn't have anything and you didn't have any strap, you could use shirts or you could do a shirt tightly around it and tie it so they could actually breathe because maybe they still have to carry something out. And the tip removal. So pay attention, constantly relate to your surroundings, know your landmarks, look behind you, they look different from opposite directions. Write down your landmarks and draw a rough map as you go. I always have, um, you could do, you see marks and piles of stones, you know, in some places, those old currents. Use your compass and map, find landmarks that orient with north, south, east, and west. When you can, use the sun if you're good at that. And you can learn all this stuff online, which is pretty cool. The North Star lines up with the two stars forming the outside edge of the Big Dipper. So a baseline, it can be a road, a trailhead, a power line, anything that forms a line. So if you thought you were at the power line mountain biking or hiking or something like that, and then you were walking away from the power line into the woods or something, you want to make sure that you knew where that road was, right? Because if you're wandering around here and going this way, if you kept that in sight, you knew that you kept that in sight that if you walked back this way, you could eventually hit your baseline again. You can walk so um, if you don't know how to use a topo map, topo map, Terrain appears as a series of these contour lines. I put one up there. And these are really cool ones that they have right now. Those are waterproofs. So you can just like get, you know, you can get them wet, it can rain on or anything like that. So when these lines are really close together, what does that mean? Anybody know? Steep. Yeah, that's really steep. And when it's wider and spread out like that, that's much more, um, you know, shallow, flat like a valley. But the best thing to do is to look around and see, okay, I know that mountain and I know that mountain know those landmarks. So use your map, using a map without a compass, line the map up so the features in the map are approximately as they appear on the ground. So if I use this map, it's super like immigrant wilderness, you use this as pine crest lakes. Like, well, I don't know pine crest lakes. Okay, what's, what am I familiar with? Okay, immigrant, all I really know an immigrant is like out by Kirkwood, that there's immigrant lake. So I would know where that is. And then I would note that on my map and put that to the north. And we'll do a little map right here. Yeah. Thank you. Is anybody bored yet or anything? Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dale from the British Bushcraft School, and today I'm going to give you some tips on survival. We're not doing this. Okay, this is a campus, a fairly cheap and cheerful campus. Cost about eight pounds. Um, and it's a company called Silver. Uh, it's a really important to have one of these when you're out in the wilderness because it helps you stay on path and stops you getting lost. Consists of one main part, which is this needle here, which is a floating needle, and that will always point to magnetic north. Underneath that is a rotating bezel. Underneath that is a base plate. If you want to find north, all you have to do is look at where that needle is pointing. And that's the most basic skill with this, and that will always point to north. From there on in, you need to use a map together with the campus so you can work out where to walk and what route to walk on. He's not going to keep staring at me. Right? the basic skill called orientating the map to the north. If we imagine we're on this peak here called High Rays, you can see on the map that you've got lines traveling up and down and across like this. These lines are going down north-south, and the lines that go across are east, are east and west. You take your compass, and you want to turn the bezel, which is this bit here, so that the arrow there is in line with the arrow there. Place the edge of the compass alongside one of these blue lines that goes up and down. So this is pointing to the north here. You know that this is the north top of the map because everything's all written so that you can read it, it's not upside down. So when the writing's right here, you know that's north. Then once you've got 
the side of the compass lined up with this north-south line. You then want to turn the map, as you can see, this floating needle here is staying fixed in the north position. If we turn it round, there we go, we now know that this map is orientated to north. The north needle is over this page plate and this rotating bezel which is in line with the north-south lines here. Then once you've got your map orientated, if it's nice clear weather, you should be able to pick out the peaks around you and identify the features. If not, you may need to walk on bearing. So for example, if we were on high rays, and we need to walk, needed to walk down along this ridge here, what you do is you put the base plate on the map with the straight side in the direction in which you're going to walk, like so. You then turn this rotating bezel until these lines on the bottom of the rotating part line up with these blue lines that run north and south on here. You have to look quite closely for that and you may need to move your compass around just a little bit just to make sure it's lined up with north. Once you've got everything lined up, you can then take the compass off and this arrow here will point your direction of travel. So if you walk along the line of that arrow, you'll be able to reach your destination. So that's one of the main situations where you need a compass. It's where you start from, it's the most basic compass skill. Always worth carrying one of these, even if it's a bright summer's day, the weather can always turn pretty nasty pretty quickly. So always be safe, have a good one with you. So I think you know how to use that now after a while. You get them everywhere. You're on iPhones now too. Yeah. iPhones, yeah. 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 If your iPhone doesn't work, it won't work better than anything. Plus, it's amazing. Actually, it works no matter what. Really? Where you are, yeah. It uses a magnetic device inside. Uh, a GPS thing. To constantly work. Yeah, well, for batteries. Yeah, what if your batteries? Well, then you have a solar charger in your pack, right? Then you just duct tape your phone to the inside there and put it away. And if you didn't want this tape on them, then you just put the tape to tape, right? If you didn't want this tape on them, then you could make it so it wouldn't stick to them. Yeah. Unless, you know, you wanted, like, a wax. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted it, you know. <laughs> so if you are lost, stop. Once you realize you're lost, do stop it. Do not keep traveling. Continue traveling may compound your situation. Stay calm, remain calm, and make sure you are warm and dry. This is awesome to have this person in your group. Stay calm. Think, look around you. Is there higher ground from which you might spot landmarks? Is there a baseline? You know, we talked about baseline, whether it's a power line, some sort of, we can see the edge of the lake, what lake we have. So especially if it's getting dark, stay put or move to a nearby area where you can set up a shelter and build a fire. In fine print, don't build a fire like on a day like today. <laughs> Find or build a shelter before you get too cold or too tired. Do not wait until it gets dark. We're talking about what foods to eat and drink at certain times of day for keeping warm also. So your basically strategy, use signals to make your location conspicuous and attract rescuers to your site. Okay, I'm sorry my husband's on fire. <laughs> so this could be super. Uh, attract rescuers to your site. So bright colors, like I like the orange, like this. Wearing white out in the snow, probably not perfect. Three of anything, three of gunshots, but not useful in hunting season. Uh, whistle blast, so you have your whistle, fire, smoke columns, flags. Universe, it is universally known as a distress signal, or three, anything of threes. So SOS, tramp in the snow, Bows on the snow, bark material to make it more visible, a flashing mirror. Um, a lot of those, like those little tiny things with the lint in it. One of these things has, well, this thing has a compass at the end of it. That's kind of cool. I think one of them has like a mirror in it or something. That one has a mirror in it. So this is kind of like the one wheel. They're really cool that take one. So there's, uh, so anything, a whistle, a flashlight, or a flag. So dot, 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 pause. Dash, 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 pause, dot, dot, dot. So S O S. So a short blink with a light or a short blast on a whistle or dot. So short things are dots and then dashes are longer. Okay? So if you're gonna do a whistle, you could go, then you go. Like 
I'm not going to do what that was sold in. So the dots are short and the dashes are long. With flags to the right are dots and the left are dashes. So carry something over shelter. So I like the poncho idea. I like camping with a tarp. You could use the space blanket, but I guess if you're really cold. Here are some ideas like this you could use with trees and things like that. So the purple is kind of like your, this is like your parachute rope. Here you could use the poncho, you could use a tent. Um, this, but you might even bring a tent on a daytime type thing, right? If you were really, I'm not, I'm not into the TV, that's way too much work, putting the sticks up and tying it, putting stuff around it up. I don't have that kind of stuff to do anything. But I like this wooden, I like a tree like this and then putting a rope around here and then chucking it with some rocks in one of the duffel bags and then hanging something like that and you could sit in there. This one right here is like a lean-to piece of wood against there and then you could drape it over like a little tent. But then there's caves and things like that. You gotta think about what kind of weather. Is there a monsoon coming? You don't want to be someplace low, things like that. So you need shade and the ventilation when it's hot. Observe the rules of three. Carry three sources of fire in your pack. Matches. Fire starter like the paper, the lint. Um, I asked my husband what fire would be most easy to use. Pitch, dry grass, dead leaves, toilet paper. Hopefully they're dirty. Don't waste your clean paper. Find the fuel, dry twigs, needles, and then you need fuel, heat, and oxygen for building the fires. Attempt to keep the low, uh, locate out of the wind. Gather all the materials before you start. Maybe before it gets dark. Um, start with small material and work up slowly and make sure the flame has oxygen like a teepee, kind of a log house. Food. Take your survival foods with you more than you need. Light, high calorie, easily digestible food from groups below. Carbohydrates should be the bulk of your food. This is not in Women's Health magazine. <laughs> Forget all that. Should be the bulk of your food, fats, fatty meats, like dried meats, cheeses, nuts, with major sorts of calories, so no important for the cold weather. Proteins like meat, meat, milk, cheese, cereals, peas, beans are kind of hard to digest, so this should be a minor part of like a survival diet if you're stuck out there. And then you don't want to have big meals if you're survival eating. You want to have like a little bit to keep your metabolism going and to kind of keep you being able to think. Eat numerous small ones during the day. Eat easily digestible foods, such as like candies and fruits and carbs at night. For more warmth, eat the fatty and the carb, the uh, fatties and the proteins and the nuts and things like that. Maybe the jerkies and things. So survival foods are pork, granola, dried fruit, nuts, jerky. Bars. Uh, Gorp is like the, um, the those big bags you can get that have you can make it your own. So it has like M and M's, raisins, peanuts, and cashews. Yeah. Gorp is like a call it. So water your basic strategy. Bring it with you when possible. Water is the most more important than food. Carry some method of purification. Boil any water you find at least for five minutes. So I this I did this in Peru and Bolivia. Very time consuming. Um, it has multiple filters, but I never got sick on it. But I also went to a low. My dad gave this to me for Christmas. This is an awesome gift. This is like one of those uh, steri pins, and depending on how much water. Depending on how big your little thing is like this, all you do is hold the light and it tells you to hold it and it like zaps it with this light. It's like, yeah, ultra light. It's, a, it's like Star Trek. So you just go in there and I, my kids and I were at Aloha Lake. Not a lot of fresh water was moving in it because it was really low last year. And we didn't we use this for three days and we didn't get sick and we didn't do this whole filtering that kind of thing and just put it in there. And I think you hold it shorter for like half a liter and for a liter you hold it longer. I, I think this thing is awesome. And I was passing around, it's very cool. And it comes with directions on how long you hold it. So sources of water, at the head of a narrow canyon or gully, at the base of cliffs, dry or damp riverbeds, if you don't get water and very, you know, where you're gonna find it, 
Um, don't go that far if you don't find a dry or damp riverbed. Where ground is damp or muddy, you can find it. In the morning, if there's a lot of dew, you can actually get it from um, from vegetation. So a lot of people do that down in the lower level with lots of fog and stuff like that. So this is like when you're really out there. Uh, do this before the sun rises or will evaporate. Check your wetland areas and, and flush your freshwater fish. I don't fish, I love fish, but I guess if you were fishing, you could drink the water from the freshwater fish. Okay. Assume water you find is contaminated and must be pure, purified or boiled. Do not eat snow and ice, melt it first. Do not drink urine, blood, or seawater. Where, po uh, where possible, filter the glacier milk. So if you're like in Alaska and it's milky, let it settle before you drink it. Avoid water that has a metallic or chemical taste. Do not take fluids from any plants, unless you know it's safe to digest from the plant. Extra tidbits like lightning. So seek shelter, right? Get off the water. Get off the tops of ridges. Don't huddle, spread out. I learned that when you're ice skating on frozen ground too. Starts cracking, spread out. <laughs> don't, don't skate on next to each other. <laughs> Crouch down if you're exposed. In um, avalanche areas, high risk or certain degrees, 30 to 45 degree slopes. High risk times are after heavy storm or high winds. Never travel alone. I always travel with that cool disaster bag and a sleeping bag and a tow rope and a shovel in my car. I use all of those that look here. Safer routes are the top of bridges or valley floors. If you must cross an avalanche path, you want to um, secure your clothing. You want to loosen. I'm not even going to do this. You want to loosen your poles. You don't want to have these on because if you got into an avalanche, you'd be like all tangled. You want these to be free flying. And you want to try to swim like dogs. That's why they usually do well in avalanches because they're good swimmers. Unbuckle and loosen packs so you can loosen and lose that. You want to travel apart from each other. And you know, this is not rocket science. Don't discharge firearms. <laughs> I think that's it. It's a lot. Oh, I went over. Sorry. And three phone calls. That's pretty neat. Kidding me. I'm so sorry. Um, let's see. What do I have to? I have, I have a first aid kit for my dog. So this has other kind of stuff in it. I make sure that she carries all the trash out. That's where I put all my food when I hoist it up. This is if anybody wants to look at anything in here. And that's it. I guess you probably have a good list of stuff you want to start off with packing for the summer, right? Yeah, Does anybody have any questions? Oh, yes. I do. Well, like, um, a friend of ours is a wild, like his smoke jumper, and he claims he wants to teach his son. How to use a flint thing, and I like just put a charcoal lighter on it, like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or the flint. Or I totally because what are you doing all the time? You have this lint from your dryer, and it catches fire. It catches houses on fire all the time. So I have this icky gross lint and my dry matches. And the other one has a whistle. Has a cool thing. Has a whistle on it and the mirror for catching on the sun if you need to catch. Um, you know, a helicopter. But there's lots of neat wilderness survival sites online where you can like take a pre-test to see like how much do you know type thing, and then it gives you pointers. Uh, REI has tons of lists on check-off lists to take before you go kayaking and backpacking and stuff like that. Do you utilize it in spot on tracker places? Um, only for my avalanche, I have a beacon for that. But I don't. I do not use my phone and my GPS at all when I go backpacking or camping. That phone is off. No equipment. Yeah, just an emergency. Like I would turn it off. I would have it off, and then if I need to have an emergency, I would. But I don't use it to just make sure I follow the rivers and just start practicing the maps. I only have it for avalanche when I'm back in country speed. My husband and I have that set up. Yeah. And I, I wish, yeah, I'm so glad you guys were here. I wish there was like 40,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> so you could all learn.
but there's lots of um, that really great guy that teaches that little wilderness, that little class. He's got all those compass classes and wilderness things. And also, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Been waiting on.